contrary to what I said last week, it's actually a big week on the GCN Racing News Show this time around. There's a new presidential candidate in the house. We check in with David Miller as he runs for election for the CPA, the Professional Riders Union. I think that's the biggest thing. I think they underestimate the fact that I've already lost everything once. And and I do believe that I can change things. The World Championships kicks off in Innsbruck, the Cyclocross World Cup in Wisconsin, plus we've got a whole host of one-day races down in Italy, Belgium and France, including some dramatic cornering at the Trofeo Matteotti. 2018 marked the final year of the Team Time Trial World Championships as we know them. From next year, there'll be national teams competing in a men's and women's Team Time Trial, and the sum of those two times will determine the country's finishing position. Fitting then that the winners this year were essentially the same as they were when this event was reintroduced back in 2012. Quick step on the men's side and Canyon SRAM on the women's. Canyon SRAM caused quite the upset and also quite the stir in fact with those zip disc wheels. They haven't won a single team time trial so far this year but they were 21 seconds to the good of pre-race favourites Bulls Dormans and a further 7 seconds ahead of reigning champions Team Sunweb. Over in the men's event, Team Sky faced not just a literal, but a metaphorical uphill battle on the day, as they lost Ian Stannard to a crash after just one kilometre of racing. But even more disappointed were BMC Racing. They've kind of made this discipline their own over the last few years, but could only manage third in their final outing. Team Sunweb pushed Quickstep closest at 19 seconds. You have to say though, it was a course of two halves, the first very flat, with the best teams averaging over 60 kilometers per hour for the first 40 Ks, before a significant climb, which got many riders into trouble. Now, also over in Innsbruck this week, on Thursday to be precise, will be the election for the president of the CPA. Never heard of them? Well, don't worry, because until recently, neither had some of the riders that it represents. It's been a controversial subject over the past couple of weeks, and last Thursday in London, we spoke to David Miller to find out why. Uh, David, thank you for joining us. I guess we should go back to basics to start with, because a lot of the viewers will have no idea what the CPA is. So what is the CPA, and what is it there to do? The CPA uh, is an acronym for the Cycliste Professionnel Associé, the Professional Cyclist Association. It's uh, the international union for professional cyclists, male professional cyclists at world tour and prof professional continental level. That equates to about a thousand uh, bike riders. It was created in 1999 um, and it's uh, recognized and endorsed and also funded partly by the UCI. Uh, and it's also got a joint agreement with the AIGCP, which is the team's organization. Uh, so the foundations are for a great organisation that represents the riders and uh, is uh, a very strong and international body. So you've decided to go for presidency yourself, a fairly recent decision to go up against the current president which is also a former professional rider Gianni Bugno. Uh, where did that decision on your part come from? Um, well, I've done some work with CPA in the last three or four years. And went to a couple of committee meetings and saw how it worked, represented them with the UCI and had some interest in, in helping. I thought it had a lot of potential as a body and I knew that Jenny Bunyo was coming to the end of his term. And so I'd actually spoken with Jenny Bunyo and some of the other key uh, members of the committee about perhaps become the next president. And it, they were, showed interest and it was almost sort of informally agreed. And then at the end of last year, um, after David Lepatiant had become the new UCI president, uh, I found out that Jenny Bunyo had decided to run for another term, um, kicking off this year for another four years. And I, I was kind of like, well, that's a bit strange. And, and I thought, you know what, I actually don't want to work with a body that works like that anyway, because that seems a conflict of interest, the UCI president endorsing and, and kind of essentially nominating the, the, the president of the Riders' Union. And so I left it and I walked away and I thought, well, I won't do anything with it then. It seems like it's just going to carry on the way it is. And then I found out a month ago that there is a, an election, probably five weeks ago now. And I thought, ooh, maybe I can kind of cause some change here by, by raising awareness. And that was my, my initial thought. I, I, I then got in touch with them and said, how does a vote work? And they didn't know because they've never had a vote before for yeah, anything. Tell us how the vote works because that's been the most controversial thing. A lot of riders have been outspoken about that recently. Yes. How does the election of the CPA work? So the election of the CPA is, the CPA is made up of a committee and the committee is made up of six member nations. Now, there are only six member nations because the other countries uh, around the world haven't uh, created a union that is affiliated to the CPA for one reason or another. Those member nations are France, Italy, Spain, Switzerland, North America and Portugal. 
there's one person from each of those countries which is a delegate on that committee. That delegate uh, carries the votes of every single World Tour and Pro Continental rider in their country. So it totals up to about 435 votes, 450 votes between those six, those six votes. It's called block voting. Um, so that means the moment the French delegate puts their hand up, that's 150 people. Now, that means... And have they been voting within France for you know, the, yeah. the election to, this is to the, go forward and give that vote? As in the riders, have they said what they want? Well, this is what I've now learned and has really kind of concerned me is the fact that those delegates do not poll their riders. So they don't even... So the delegate's been deciding him or herself? Yeah, the delegates decide for their riders without asking their opinion or even doing any, barely even asking their opinion, definitely not doing any polls or voting. Which the riders have now learned and have discovered that's been going on for a long time and are obviously a little bit, I think, disappointed would be a nice way of putting it. Mm. Now, the riders can vote, the professional cyclists, um, are for the president of the, the CPA, but they have to come to Innsbruck on September 27th to the hotel where the General Assembly is and vote in person. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, I know that Italy and France have already agreed to vote for Gianni Bugno. That's 150, 120, it's 273, yeah, 270 votes uh, that are already uh, designated Gianni Bugno. There's not even 200 riders going to the Worlds. If there are, already 20 are gone because the riders who are French and Italian don't have a vote because their delegates voted for them. So it means that it's impossible to win because there's not going to be enough individual riders. So this has all kind of come to light now. And it sounds like uh, you've already decided that you've got a very small chance of winning given the way that the election is done. So you know, why continue on now? Uh, it's raising awareness in a sense. It's, I think making this noise is, is it's educating, firstly, the peloton. The peloton didn't know anything about this, and they, it's been behind closed doors. It's sports governance at its very worst, to a certain degree. So that's, that's one good thing. It's educating them. It's educating the, the public through the media. The, the public are now learning, and that will help to hopefully uh, bring, make more noise. But one thing that's been really good about it is actually joining the peloton together. Very rarely have we seen the peloton actually start to have a unified voice and opinion and, and shared vision. And, and that's very encouraging and it, and it goes to show that it's possible. So I guess the next question is, what makes you the best person for this job? And I say that because obviously you, you've got a history, you've doped in the past, you've admitted to that. And so when you look at the response, for example, to Dan Martin's tweet on social media, there were a lot of critics saying, well, why on earth would you want this person to represent you and your body given his past? And so you know, that is my question to you. Would it not be better to have somebody that's fresh out of the peloton and has a clean pass to do the representation of the riders? Um, yeah, and I can understand the controversy and I think it's been, I, I take my hat off to the riders that have shown the public support, the first ones, because they did it knowing they would take flack for supporting me. Um, but I've been, I think anybody who knows me and has known me the last 12 years know, knows how much I've fought behind the scenes uh, for riders' rights. First of all, with anti-doping movements representing. I've worked with national anti-doping organizations, the World Anti-Doping uh, Association, the international federations, race organizers. I'm not scared of rocking the boat. That's one, I think that's the biggest thing. I think they underestimate the fact that I've already lost everything once. And, and I do believe that I can change things uh, simply because I, I don't like thinking that that people can get away with treating the athletes uh, as the, the bottom of the food chain. I think that's just wrong. It's what got me into a lot of trouble at the beginning was the kind of the governance being so bad. Mm. So I think it's, I think I'm in a very rare and unique position. Um, and it's thanks to the, the, the crap I went to that, that I kind of got to this point. Certainly going to be pretty interesting to see how that whole thing plays out. Next up, we had four Italian one-day races over the last week, all of which you can catch full highlights of over on our Facebook page. The first of those, the Giro della Toscana, saw Gianni Moscon take his second victory in three races. The Italian had attacked with Roman Bardet the final time at the Montessera and outsprinted him at the finish. Sprinting to victory the following day was Juan Jose Lobato. It marked the first victory in a troubled season for the Spaniard, who had been thrown off Lotto Enel Yumbo at the start of the year for being in possession of sleeping tablets. Not against the UCI rules, but against internal team rules. 
And then came the dominance of Androni Sidemeg. Uh, they dominated at the Memorial Marco Pantani and the Trofeo Matteotti. Davide Ballerini had only won one race in his career before Saturday. Now he's won three. The 24-year-old took back-to-back -back victories at the weekend in very similar fashion, keeping up with the climbers on the climbs, out sprinting them all on the flat finishes. Nairo Quintana used those races as his final preparation for the World Championships, but his brother Dea had a particularly nasty looking crash at the Trofeo Matteotti. The Colombian completely lost control of his bike on a fast sweeping left-hander, but thankfully he came off lightly with little in the way of injuries. Lucky boy, that could have been a whole lot worse looking at how bad that was. Cross is here. Most of the world's best riders were in Wisconsin over the weekend for the opening round of the World Cup, including Wout van Aert, the world champion, despite recently having a rather messy ending of his contract with his team, Verandas Willems Kralan. The world champion raced in plain kit, well, about as plain as you can get when you've got rainbow bands around it, but he didn't have it all his own way on the day. Tuna stole a march on his Belgian rival, dropping him with two laps to go and taking the win by 34 seconds, and with it, his first ever World Cup leader's jersey. Van Aert, though, did take an early advantage over his arch nemesis, Mathieu van der Poel, who had decided to skip travelling to the States. Meanwhile, making the trip and making it worthwhile was his compatriot, Mariana Voss. The former world champion is doing a full cross campaign this year, but she was pushed very hard on the day by the American rider Ellen Noble. Noble finished just four seconds back, and for her, at just 23, it was the best World Cup result of her career so far. And so it is Ellen who is this week's GCN Rider of the Week. Losing by four seconds to Voss is no mean feat. Up in Northern Europe, Mass Pedersen won the Euro Metropole under typically Belgian conditions on Saturday, whilst the following day, Philippe Gilbert made his return to competition after fracturing his kneecap in this crash at the Tour de France. First race back, first win. Doesn't really get much better than that. Surprisingly, actually, it was his first win of the whole season. That brought Quick Step's season tally up to 69, which must be satisfying. Uh, in the women's event, there was a 1-2 for Groupama FDJ, with Lauren Kitchen taking it ahead of Roxanne Fournier. And there was a particularly attacking race at the Hoek Sapil in Belgium. Eventually there, a six-man group contested the win, with Jordi Muse of the SEG Racing Academy delivering the win on an uphill sprint to the line. Uh, he got the better of Amund Janssen and Martin Mortensen. One final race though before we let you know of an exciting live race coming up for us tomorrow here on GCN. Uh, Cassia Nubia Doma sealed the deal on the overall GC at the Tour Cycliste Feminin Internationale de l'Ardèche on Tuesday, proving that she'll be a force to be reckoned with at the World Championships this coming Saturday. Right then, put a note in your diaries because tomorrow, Tuesday at 7pm BST, we have the GCN Innsbrucking Handicap Race. As the name suggests, the starting order will be determined by ability on your FTP per weight. And as such, our very own James Losley Williams will start in the penultimate group with Oscar Pujol in the scratch group going off last. Now you can either beat them or if not, you can just join them as the event is open to all. There's a link in the description below where you can register. Alternatively, you could just watch online with some top quality commentary from yours truly. Don't let that put you off though, you've always got the mute button if you need it. Okay, that is all from me this week. Uh, next week though, I'll be back reporting on all of the action from the World Championships where we've got the individual time trials and the road races. Uh, speaking of which, don't forget to tune in to our big preview show, which should be out this coming Wednesday. In the meantime, if you missed this video, it's well worth checking out because Cy got to go behind the scenes at the Oakley Glasses headquarters over in California. You can find that by clicking just down here.